Our topic this week from the book of Genesis, chapter 12, Abram in Egypt. Starting in verse 4, Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all the possessions that they had gathered and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed and they came to the land of Canaan. And so Abraham's 75 years old. That makes Sarah 65 years old at this point. We don't know how old he was when he left Ur of the Chaldeans. Doesn't tell us. We don't know how long he spent in Haran. It was long enough for his uh, father to die there and bury him. Um, and then he leaves there. So we, again, we don't know uh, how long he was there. It doesn't mention. But we did have enough time to acquire more possessions and more people to to help him in his work. And, uh, and so uh, maybe he, from inheritance of his father, or maybe what they sold in Ur, and they were able to purchase things in Haran to help them. But obviously he has some wealth already to begin with, that he's purchasing things and, and traveling. Uh, and it mentions that Lot, his nephew, comes with him. Now, you'll notice we pointed out this last week, and we'll get more into it again future weeks, but it just mentions Lot. It doesn't mention Lot as having a wife yet at this point. We don't know Lot's age, um, but Lot is the son of Abram's, probably his youngest brother, the three brothers that were mentioned. Lot, Abram mentioned first, and uh, Nahor, I think it was Nahor, uh, uh, Lot's father, mentioned last. So again, we don't know the age difference there. Uh, but again, he's not mentioned with a wife. We'll see he ends up with a wife later on in the biblical account. But at this point, he still is not mentioned as having a wife. And so the, the three of them, with all their, uh, their help, those that are helping them, those who work for them, and all their possessions, leave Haran and begin to come to Canaan. And you see on the, on the map there, so Or is, uh, is way down here. And so... Israel is over here. It says Jerusalem there. It wasn't called Jerusalem in Abram's day, but that's how the map has it there on this map. And so the most direct route would be that way, uh, but it might be the longest one because you would die on your way, right? So uh, you're going through the desert there and the mountains there. And so no one went that direction. They would go from Or, they would go up through Babylon, and then up, and it's called the Fertile Crescent. Maybe you can kind of see it's greenish there and all brown here, the desert here. So they would go up and then Haran up at the top and then back down to Damascus and Dan and then down into what was then Canaan, now Israel. And so again, that's why it's called the Fertile Crescent. And that's why when Babylon, later on in the Bible, when Babylon ends up attacking Jerusalem, it's referred to as the King of the North. Uh, not that Babylon was north. Obviously, Babylon is almost directly east of Jerusalem as bird flies, but they attacked from the north. And so they're referred to as coming from the north. And the same with Assyria and Syria and other attacks that came uh, down to Israel. They'd come down through, uh, it's now Lebanon, and through, again, Damascus area, and then down into to Israel from the north, even if they were coming from the east. Okay, a good little kind of picture view of that. All right, in verse 6, Abram passed through the land to the place of, of Shechem, as far as the Terebith tree of Moriah, Morah, and the Canaanites were then in the land. So he's not going and just inheriting a, an empty land. There are people there and they're Canaanites. And Canaan comes from the, 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 the family of Canaan came from uh, Noah, Noah's son Ham. Ham had Canaan and then the Canaanites. Now, uh, Abram would have been from Noah's son Shem. So different family lines uh, from Noah's, two of Noah's three sons. So they come to Shechem, and when they're there in Shechem, verse 7, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to you and your descendants, I will give this land. That is a wonderful promise. I'm giving this land to you and to your descendants. And miraculously, not in Abraham's day, but God eventually did, and came out of Egypt, and till that time, from that time till this time, over 3,000 years, 3,500 or so years, uh, there have been Jewish people living in the land of Israel where Abraham was standing. Now, there were periods of time where, 
where we weren't there as, as populous as other times, uh, when Babylon came in and dispersed uh, people, there were still a remnant still stayed in Israel. And then even after the Romans came through and destroyed Jerusalem and destroyed the temple, and we were dispersed again uh, for uh, 19 or so hundred years, even through that time, there was always a remnant who stayed uh, in the land. So there's been a Jewish presence in the land for almost continually for, again, close to 4,000 years, 3,500 to, to 400 years. Uh, it's an amazing prophecy given to a man who's wandering around, who doesn't own any land. Uh, it's just him and his wife, and they don't have any children. And they're up there in age. So pretty amazing promise that God makes to Abram. It says the Lord appeared to Abram. And so we don't know if this was a physical appearance. Uh, we do know that God does physically appear to Abram. And Yeshua said that Abram saw my day and was glad. And so this could be the, one of those physical appearing of the Lord to, to Abram, or he could have appeared through a voice or, or impression. Um, but the Lord appeared and gives this wonderful promise to, to Abram. And uh, it meant a lot to him. And again, God fulfills his promises. God is faithful uh, in this promise and to um, all his promises. And this promise applies to us as well. All who, as we read the other week, all who are in Messiah uh, are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And all of us need to go through that process, whether we're a blood lineage directly from Abraham or not. We need to come through the Messiah to become truly Abraham's children of faith, because there are plenty, uh, such as Achan in the time of, of Joshua or, or, uh, or many others down through the ages, Judas, many others, who were of the bloodline lineage, but not of the faith lineage, and who uh, will not inherit the eternal land. And so we have the eternal promise that to your descendants I will give this land, not only just a little sliver of, of earth uh, the size of New Jersey uh, that, uh, that doesn't have uh, any uh, profitable oil on the land. Thankfully, now they found some uh, natural gas out in the, uh, the coastal ways, um, and a big portion of it desert. But the new heavens and new earth, the meek shall inherit the earth that God will give to the children of faith of Abraham through the Messiah. And so this wonderful promise was given to Abraham, but applies to all who become a part of Israel, Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promises. And so Abraham responded well in verse 7. Abraham built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. And so no doubt giving a, a, maybe a thank offering, a, a praise offering to the Lord for this wonderful promise, uh, surrendering his life and showing a demonstration and a dedication to the Lord. He builds an altar, uh, offers a sacrifice to the Lord there. And, and that's appropriate when we read God's word, we accept his promises and and we're thankful for what God has done in our life. And that's why there's all these various different offerings mentioned in the Bible. Peace offering, thank offering, burnt offering, for various different things. Forgiveness of sins, but also giving thanks and praise to the Lord and, and furthering his work. And so various different means and, and reasons and, and titles. Then verse 8, Abraham moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east, and there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So he builds another altar and is calling on the name of the Lord. And we read about Enoch centuries before this calling on the name of the Lord and Seth calling on the name of the Lord. And so Abraham is calling on the name of the Lord, crying out to him for guidance, for direction, building altars, sacrificing and giving praise towards God. And he's on the move, going through the land uh, with all the flocks and herds that he had. He would have had to keep them moving so that they don't eat it down dead and that there's enough for them to continue to eat and water. And so they, they're traveling through and he's building altars to the Lord. And he's crying out to the Lord and calling out to the Lord. So he went to Shechem and now to uh, near Bethel. And then verse 9, and Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south, uh, the word there in south is Negev. It's the Negev Desert in southern Israel. 
And so he kept on journeying through and, and building altars along the way. And there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there, for the famine was severe in the land. And I guess before I get into the, the famine and going down to Egypt, I do want to mention about him building these altars as he traveled around and building these altars everywhere he stopped uh, and put up his tents. Um, no doubt he came in contact with other people in the land, the Canaanites, as they would need to trade for various different things and sell off some of his flock or the, or the wool or, or the, uh, the leather and to receive whatever he might have needed, tools or, or other types of food that he wasn't able to have on his own. Uh, and so as he interacted with these people and they maybe see, see the altar there and they'd say, well, where's your idol? And they'd say, well, I don't worship a, a, a God made of hands, not a God of my creation, but I worship the God of the universe, the God who created all things, the God who created us, not us creating him, a God who's too big to put into a, a little figurine or a stone or wood, the God of, of the universe, the God of all things. And, uh, and I'd be able to teach them. And I built this altar here and I offer sacrifices to him, not in order to gain his love. He's already loved me. He's already first promised me. He didn't give me the promise before I, uh, uh, he gave me the promise before I even gave an offering to him. He sought me out. He seeks us out. He comes looking to save us, to help us, to bless us. He first loved us. And so I give these offerings as thankfulness and praise to him. I give these offerings for forgiveness of sins. These substitution, maybe told them about Adam and Eve and how they sinned. And, 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 and God said the, the wages of sin would be death. If they ate from that tree, they would die. And God allowed them to give a sacrifice in place of themselves. That they would die to self, but they would be able to live on because of the sacrifice in their behalf. And all of that pointing forward to the Messiah to come. And so he might have been able to witness and share God's word. And then even as he traveled on, those altars stayed there, and people would come by and they would see those altars there, and they may say, well, who built this altar? And then the locals would be able to tell them, oh, that guy Abraham lived there. He's the one who built that altar. And maybe they accepted and, and, and told the story as well. Or maybe they say, some kind of crazy guy. <laughs> he didn't even have any idols. <laughs> But either way, the gospel will be told as he left those altars along the way. And it's good for us to set up altars everywhere we are, everywhere we live and everywhere we go in our home and, and at work and school and wherever we are in our neighborhoods, set up witnesses for God that we need to be a living altar, a living sacrifice for him. That people come to know God because of us. Places where we give thanks to the Lord. Set times and maybe a set place in your home or your favorite place. I mean, you can pray everywhere and we should be praying at all times and without ceasing. But it's good also to have a kind of a set chair or set place in your home where you have your Bible and you're able to sit and meditate and quiet and good lighting and, and be able to pray and read and, and meditate to the Lord. Set up an altar in a sense. Not to be a physical thing. Again, it might just be your lounge chair, you know, or a couch, or wherever you're comfortable. But again, where you can read the Bible and quiet, meditate, shut out the distractions of the world, and be in His presence. So we come here now to verse ten. There was a famine in the land, and Abraham went down to Egypt and dwelt there, for the famine was severe in the land. Now it doesn't mention in this verse or any previous or future verse of whether or not God told him to go down to Egypt. Or even if Abraham asked, he said, there's a famine in the land, God, what should I do? Should I go down to Egypt? What should I do? Should I go back to Haran? What should I do? It doesn't mention that. It just says there was a famine in the land, and Abraham went down to Egypt. God told him, this land I will give to you and your descendants. God told him, leave or the Chaldeans and go to Canaan. It doesn't say go to Canaan and then to Egypt and then back to Canaan. And so I think Abraham moved by fear and not by faith at this point. And we're going to see this, this jaunt in Egypt was not a good thing. 
We don't have to go to the world to receive God's help. Now, sometimes God will use people of the world. God will use maybe a plumber in your life or an electrician in your life or a doctor in your life or a lawyer in your life who doesn't know the Lord, doesn't serve the Lord, if that's how God directs. And God can use them. And Abraham probably interacted in commerce with those in Canaan, but all for a purpose so that God could, Abraham could share God's love with them. But we don't become part of the world. God could have provided for Abram even in the famine. I'm sure there were plenty of Canaanites who stayed in Canaan who didn't go down to Egypt because of the famine and they survived. God ends up providing for us in the wilderness for 40 years every day. God could have provided in many miraculous ways for Abraham even in spite of the famine. Now again, Abraham didn't have all the stories that we have. Abraham didn't have the whole Bible that we have. He had some stories that uh, maybe he heard from, from maybe from Noah himself or, or Shem. So again, so far we're only in chapter 12 of the Bible, so the most it would have is, is like 10 or so chapters worth of, of stories to encourage his faith. But God could have provided Kind of like later on, we have uh, Naomi and her husband, uh, El Elimelech, uh, who, uh, who were in Bethlehem, and there was a famine in Bethlehem. And so they go to Moab. And in Moab, the two sons marry two Moabite women. Uh, the three men die. The father and the two sons end up dying there. And then Naomi comes back to Bethlehem, and when she comes back to Bethlehem, lo and behold, her friends are still alive. Her friends are still there. They didn't all die because of the famine. So they didn't necessarily have to run to Moab to receive help. Our help cometh from the Lord. Trust not in chariots, trust not in horses. Trust in the name of the Lord our God. Put our trust in him. And if he directs you again, you know, times you would need to call the police or again, someone maybe of the world to help out, then fine, if that's what God uses. But first and foremost, go to the Lord and trust the Lord and see what God has in store. Maybe God wants to provide in some way you didn't think of, maybe some other means you already have or some other thing that you can do on your own. Maybe some natural remedy or some uh, handyman or some person or something you know from your past or you know, look online and figure out how to fix it. Uh, or maybe ask within the congregation of the Lord. And if the Lord directs again to, to, to go to someone who doesn't necessarily know the Lord, that's fine. But if, as the Lord directs. But that shouldn't be our first knee-jerk reaction every time there's a problem to run to the world. And to go and seek their help and, seek, and to fall under their protection. God is our protector. Abraham could have stayed in Canaan, and God could have provided. He could have circled back around, maybe up in Shechem. It was raining up in Shechem. He's down in the Negev now. Well, so maybe if he would have gone back to Shechem, still in the land of Canaan, there might have been enough up there, plenty up there. Or some other place. Again, there was more than just three places in Israel he could have gone to. Lots of different ways that God could have solved the problem of a famine and providing for uh, Abram and his flocks and his families, again, miraculously, or again, just some other means, going to another town or some other way, then going to Egypt. That should be the last resort, and again, only if God's directing and as God directs. Egypt's not our calling. Egypt's not our homeland. And I'm not talking physical Egypt, right? I'm just talking the things of this world, right? The unbelieving world that we live in who don't believe in God, who don't deny God, who deny the existence of God, who have their own gods. Abraham slips in his faith here. And this one slip then leads to another uh, bad judgment call. So one bad choice can lead to another and down to another and down to another and a spiral path in the wrong direction. And there's lots of people who go down to Egypt who never make it out of Egypt. And again, I'm talking spiritually here, not the physical land of Egypt, 
Uh, although I was there, like I said in the picture, and it wasn't a beautiful place as far as I was concerned. <laughs> I have no desire to go back there. But, uh, but nonetheless, uh, uh, there's plenty of people who go into the world temporarily for a job, uh, you know, or, or uh, for various different reasons, uh, friends, lonely, whatever, and don't come back. Never make it out of Egypt. Don't let fear be your motivation. Never be moved by fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and power and a sound mind. So if God doesn't give us a spirit of fear, then where does fear come from? The evil one. Right. And so don't be moved by fear. Oh, my boss says that if I don't uh, work seven days a week or work on Sabbath, he's going to fire me. I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to lose my house. I'm going to lose everything. It's going to be horrible. And I can't, or, or friends or influence or fear. And if I give back to the Lord, I won't have enough. Don't let fear be the motivation. Oh, if I don't go where there's lots of people, I'll never have a spouse or I'll never make friends. Trust the Lord. And stay in Him. Be in His will. There's peace and there's joy in God's will. There's calamity and distress in the things of this world. There's confusion, Babylon, in this world. Stay in God's will. Stay in His presence. So Abraham goes down to Egypt, motivated by fear, instead of by faith. We need to walk by faith, based on God's word, based on God's truth, and let God work his way. God will provide for all our needs according to his riches and glory. And no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. And so if it's good for you to have, then God will give it. <laughs> And if it's not good for you to have, then God won't give it. Right? We think we need a car, we think we need this house or this thing or this person, this. We don't need, we need God. And then God will provide what we need. And we can be content in him and with that. And he's able to provide and will provide for everything that we need. And again, sometimes he'll use the world to do that. But we shouldn't be seeking it out. Like God provided that way. So Abraham goes down to Egypt, and verse 11, when he was close to entering Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, Indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. Therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you that they will say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Please say you are my sister, that it may be well with, you, with me for your sake and that I may live because of you. Now, this is very weird. Right? I mean, it's just, it's just filled with weirdness there, right? I mean, he's saying, say, that you're, say you're my sister, which was half true, because it was a half-sister. <laughs> it was a half-truth. Uh, that it may be well with me for your sake. How is that for Sarah's sake? How is it for Sarah's sake that it's well with Abraham? I mean, either way, under the two scenarios, uh, if that's how it would go, and it doesn't always have to go into just two scenarios, but under the two scenarios, Abraham is the only one able to think of, they're either going to kill me and take you, and then again, she's still taken by some Egyptian to be an Egyptian's wife, uh, or if you say you're my sister, then they'll take you, and at least I'll live. <laughs> but either way, you still end up with an Egyptian husband, right? So how is that for her sake? I don't see how that benefits her at all. <laughs> so it's just totally selfish. He's just doing it for him that I may live at the sacrifice of you. I may live because of you. Again, what was he thinking of going down to Egypt if this is a possibility? And part of his problem is he's not even looking at it as a possibility. He says, he says therefore, it will happen that when the Egyptians see you, they will say this is uh, his wife and they will kill me. Who said they will kill him? Who said that they will say that this will happen? Who said that? He did. Who told them? The 
God has not given us a spirit of fear. The evil one has planted that in his head. This is what's going to happen. It's going to be the end of the world. You're going to die. You're not going to survive. This is it. it didn't have to be that way. You know, he could have gone down there and God could have protected them. Sarah could have walked around with a mustache or whatever. You know what I mean? <laughs> There's a lot of other different ways they could have come up with a solution to this, to this problem, right? Uh, put a sackcloth over her head. Yeah. Uh, but he just, fear, motivated by fear. When we're under fear, we can't see all the possibilities that God has for us. God can provide for us a thousand ways that we can't even think of. And then he narrowed it down to just these two that the devil put him in this trap over. You're going to die and your wife's going to be taken no matter what. And if that's what he was thinking, he should have turned around right then and there and God and all died in a famine. It would be better to die in a famine than under this situation. If that would have been God's will. And he knows that's not God's will because God promised him, your descendants are going to inherit the land. How is his descendants going to inherit the land if he's given his wife away? Yeah, at least, well, he's thinking he'll survive, you know. But, but he won't have his wife anymore. So now is he going to have any descendants? So it's just really sad. But that's what happens. One mistake leads to another. So stay in the Lord, stay in the Lord's will. Don't let it be moved by fear and then seeking out the devil for your help. And he says, he knows she's a beautiful woman. Now, again, she's 65 years old. Now, she lives to, she's a little over half her age at this point. She lives to 127. Uh, so she's only half, you know, half the age uh, at, this, at this rate. Verse 14. And so it was when Abram came into Egypt that the Egyptians saw the woman, that she was very beautiful. The princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commanded her, commended her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. And he treated Abram well for her sake. He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female servants, female donkeys, and camels. Now, I get the impression that these were added to Abraham, that he already had, and that Pharaoh gave him all of these things for his sister Sarah. So he was right, she was beautiful, and they did see that, and they did want her. That's how it ended up working out, but again, didn't have to. Right? He thought that, and maybe as he thought it, and with fear, that's how it turned out, but it didn't have to, even if God was calling him down there. And so, yeah, she was very, they saw that the, the average Egyptian saw that she was beautiful. The princess of Pharaoh saw her and said, she's beautiful, and she's so beautiful that they didn't even think they could have her for themselves. None of the Egyptians thought, well, I could have her for my wife. None of the princes said, I can have her for my wife. They said, she is so beautiful, she can only be for Pharaoh. And they bring her to Pharaoh. I mean, she must have been a knockout. Yeah. You know, at 65, I mean, she must have been like Barbara. I mean, it was just unbelievable. I can imagine what Sarah was like at 40, you know, or 30, 20, you know. Whew. You know, Abraham, he knew what he was, was getting. How much did he pay for her? Right? How many camels did she cost? Right, to begin with. Um, so here at 65, half her life, right? So mid midlife, and uh, and she's still being taken by Pharaoh, right to the top. Everyone commending her. She's got to be queen. And so that's where she ends up. And again, that's not a good situation. That is not good for God's plan. It's not good for Abram. He has got a bunch of stuff, but now he doesn't have his wife. It's not good for Sarah, wife of a pharaoh. There's no way to serve the Lord. The pagan husband. Verse 17, but the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with a great plague because of Sarai, Abram's wife. Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. Now, therefore, here is your wife. Take her and go your way. And Pharaoh commanded this man concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. So the Pharaoh gets plagued 
and he's not happy about it, and if it's some type of plague that keeps him from having relations with Sarah, I don't know what it was, you know, but maybe it was some kind of venereal disease or something like that, but he's not happy about it, and his whole household, and somehow through that, he knows something's up, this is not normal, and he somehow gets, I guess, Sarah to tell him what the real deal is, and he goes and he just lambasts Abram for this, rightfully so, and Abram doesn't even have an answer. Because he doesn't. He doesn't. Is this a good witness for God? No. No. It's a very sad witness. Made the Pharaoh mad. I could have taken her and was committed this sin against God by doing this. Take her. Get out of here. Sent him away. Because of this. God in his mercy protected Sarah. Not because Sarah deserved it. Not because Abram deserved it. There's nothing here demonstrating that they deserved this miracle of God. This is just strict miracle, mercy of God upon them. And one person told me, he said that uh, Abram should have been the one to get the plague, not Pharaoh. <laughs> And he's right. It doesn't make sense other than God's mercy doesn't make sense. We don't deserve God's mercy. We don't deserve anything. Well, I guess we do deserve one thing. Death. Death is the only thing we deserve. Yeah. And so everything that's not death is great. Right? It's above, beyond everything that we deserve. And God's been very good to us. And not because we deserve it, because we don't deserve anything. There's no any goodness that we could do to earn life on this earth, another day, another moment. It's not because of our goodness, not because of our good deeds. And us, talking about our generation here, living in this country, in this day, we have probably had it better than anyone who has ever lived on planet Earth since the Garden of Eden. All right, we've got more privileges, more freedom, especially in this country, more liberties, more prosperity, more ease, more time. I mean, just, what, a hundred or so years ago, they didn't have electric washing machines and dryers and dishwashers and uh, automobiles and planes and quick travel and quick communication. We have so much ease that they didn't have. Even again, 100, 150 years ago, 200 years ago, everything was laborious. Everything was hard labor. Even just to wash your clothes was hard labor. Everything was difficult. Getting food was very difficult. Now we go to the store, you can get however many types of tomatoes you want. In cans and pureed and Sauce and you know tons of different ways, tons of different brands to choose from. Still at this point, it's getting <laughs> not always going to be with the prosperity we've had, but we have a lot to be thankful for, and we don't deserve any of it. We didn't do anything to live here in this country. Nothing that we have earned it. Nothing have we done to be born in this day and age in whatever country. Again, some countries in this world still have it very rough but still probably better than in those countries 100 years ago. The prosperity that we have, the long life, doctors, eyeglasses, dentists, crowns on our teeth. You don't have to bite on a bullet or make you drunk to pull out a tooth. I mean, we got so much. Operations that you know, extend your life that in the past would have killed you. You used to have a low uh, survival of births. Just giving birth, you could die. Just giving birth, your kid could die. Now, that's an unheard of thing for the most part. We're living in an amazing age, and we don't deserve it. We should give thanks to God continually for all the mercy he has shown upon us. And he has given us these privileges and this 
extra time and his ease, not for us, but so that we have more time to share the gospel, so we can be a living witness to the world, so we can shine as lights in this last day and age. Not use it to get lazy, not use it to just watch more and do less, but so that we have the freedom to spread the gospel. Our access to communication around the world, at a touch of a few fingers on a keypad or with your thumb on a, on a piece of glass, be able to communicate around the world the gospel. And again, the time to do it. That's like we in leisure and watch the Roman Colosseum sports arenas on some beat each other's heads together, but to spread the gospel. We've got to put time on our hands, ease on our hands, longer life, healthier lives, so that we can share God's word with the Canaanites, with the Egyptians, with everybody we come in contact with, with the world, that this gospel will go to the world. And what we don't do in our time of ease, what we don't do in the daytime, we're going to have to do under troubled times, under hardships. We need to be thanking the Lord now, giving praise to the Lord now. Because again, Abraham didn't deserve any of this, and neither do we. And if we think we do, deserve anything, then we don't understand God. We don't understand ourselves. And we really don't understand even the elementary of the Bible. But this is what God does. In spite of the mistakes that we've made, and we've all made stupid mistakes like Abraham, we've all put ourselves in troublous ways, and God has spared each one of us from our stupidity, just driving down the road, we've all done stupid things. In our youth or even at any age in our life, we do stupid things. And the way we poison our bodies and the things we do to ourselves and our minds, it's the mercy of God that has kept us to this point. Yes. We're no better than Abraham. It's easy to condemn him. Oh, he went down to Egypt. Oh, he lied. Yeah, and he had 10 chapters of the Bible in his mind, not even in a book. We've got the whole entire Bible. We've got thousands of years of God's history at work. How much more accountable we are than Abraham would have been. And how many stupider things have we done than Abraham has done? How many times have we stepped into the world for help? How many times have we moved by fear how many times have we moved off of where God has planted us and God is using us and God is wanting to use us and ran away because someone didn't look at us right, because someone said something nasty, because we feared that someone was going to do this, they were going to do that, this was going to happen, that was going to happen. And we moved by fear. How many times have we lied to save our own skin, even at the sacrifice of others? But the mercy of God has given us another chance. The mercy of God has brought you and me to this day. And we need to thank him. Again, it's not because of anything you've done. It's only because of the love of God for you. And so we can thank him and praise him. And that's what we should do. And so Pharaoh says, Abraham, get out of here. Sends him away. Let's him keep this stuff. So it worked out good. God in his mercy again lets them keep all this stuff. God worked it out together for good, even Abraham's faults. Into chapter 13, Genesis 13, verse 1. Then Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had and lot with him, to the Negev. Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. And I think again it mentions that because that's, he, he gained more. He was rich when he went in, and he came out richer even before. And again, that's not a, that's not, this shouldn't be an example <laughs> to get rich. Right? You just go lie and go into the world and you come out rich. Uh, again, a lot of people don't come out at all. Um, you get lost there and go down in the depths of hell as a result. But in this account, God blessed Abraham in spite of Abraham. And God has blessed us in spite of ourselves. And not only the life that we have here, God has promised us everlasting life. 
And we don't deserve any of that. We don't deserve anything here, and there's no way that we could pay. There's no thing we could do to ever earn anything, certainly not everlasting life in the new heavens and new earth. And what we have here is nothing. It pales in comparison. This is nothing. This is actually pretty horrible compared to what heaven will be like. Again, this is better now than anywhere else on the earth and anywhere else in Earth's history. But even this is nothing compared to heaven. This is horrible compared to heaven. And God has given us that as a free gift. Nothing we can earn. Nothing we can do to make up for it. It's God's gift to us because of the Messiah's sacrifice for us. His death for us. The forgiveness of sins that we get because the Messiah, because the Father gave His Son, the Messiah died for us. That's a gift that God has given to us. While we were yet sinners, He died for us. The Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Before we sin, before humanity sinned, before you and I have sinned, before we confessed our sins, He's already forgiven us. He's already first loved us. The promise of everlasting life, the mansions He's preparing for us, is all before we were even born. Even before we confessed, even before we come to him, his great love for us. And we can reject it, and most will, but it's his gift to us, freely, by his grace. It's there for our acceptance, it's there for our appreciation. The only thing it costs us is ourselves. We die, give him our sins, give him your sins. That's all he asked. Give him your sins. Give him your carnal heart. Give him your sinful nature. Give him your sinful desires. Surrender them to him. And he gives us everlasting life. He gives us a life here on this earth. Abundant life here on this earth and for eternity. Friends and family, extended family, spiritual family here on this earth and for eternity. More than we can ever ask or think or even devise in our minds or imagine what he has in store for us. All because of his love, all because of his mercy, all because of what he has done in our behalf. And so we walk away, we walk out of this earth with great riches. And so Abraham leaves Egypt, doesn't say how long he was there. I can't imagine he was there very long. Right? The way it reads, it sounds like they went down, they saw she was beautiful, they took her to his wife, this plague happens, and before anything can have it happen, he finds out, he goes to Abraham, so maybe days, maybe weeks max, right? And he's kicked out. And where does he go? Back to the Negev. Well, I thought there was a famine in Negev. I thought he was going to die. I thought he was going to starve to death there, right? He ends up surviving. So obviously it wasn't as bad as he imagined in his mind as a fear took over. He ends up living. Now he has some extra gold and maybe helps him through. God could have provided gold in other ways than just coming from Pharaoh, if that's what it took. But he didn't have to go down to Egypt. And so he comes back to the Negev in verse 3, and he went on his journey from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there at first, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. So he goes back to where he had called on the name of the Lord. He goes back to where he built that altar. Not the first place he hears God. Again, he heard God in Ur saying, leave Ur. He heard God in Haran saying, go to Canaan. He heard God up in Shechem where he built the altar. And God said, to your descendants, I will give the land. So I don't know why it says in the beginning or the place at first, because again, there were many firsts before this. But he goes back to Bethel and he builds an altar there where he had built the altar, the place where the altar goes back to that altar, gives a sacrifice again. This time I don't think it was a thank offering, I think it would be a burnt offering, a forgiveness offering. Lord, forgive me for my lack of faith. Forgive me for my stupidity. Forgive me for putting my wife in harm's way. Forgive me for putting my nephew in harm's way and, and all that I have. Forgive me for doubting you. Forgive me for my lack of faith. And God graciously forgave him, again with the substitutionary lamb, representing the Messiah. 
in place of Abraham. Abraham dying to self, confessing his sin, calling on the name of the Lord. Lord, forgive me. Have mercy on me. Cover me with your righteousness. And keep me from falling. Work in me and through me. Let your light shine out of me. That's what God wants to do in each one of us. And God is able to do that. That's God's plan for us. And so, if you've messed up in the past, if you've made mistakes in the past, go to where you hear God's voice. Go to your Bethel, where God has spoken to you. And if in the future, and I say if, like John wrote in 1 John, he says, I tell you these things that you sin not. Obviously, in saying that, don't have to sin, right? I tell you these things that you sin not. He wouldn't say, I tell you these things if you sin not, if, it, if we're going to have to sin. But too often we hear, oh, well, you know, we're human, we're weak, we're going to sin, we're going to fall. No, he said, I tell you these things that you sin not. God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, can give us victory over sin, that we sin not. But the text continues, I tell you these things, that you sin not, but if, not when, but if you sin. Again, there's no expectation that we should sin. There's no expectation that we should rebelliously, consciously, knowingly, willingly decide to disobey God. There's no reason for that. God has given us everything we need to walk godly in Yeshua the Messiah. Everything through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we never have to consciously, willingly choose to disobey God. Never have to sin. Knowing sin, willful sin. He says, I tell you these things that you sin not, but if you sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Yeshua the Messiah. So I tell you these things, we learn from Abraham, so that you sin not, so that you're not motivated by fear, so that you don't turn your eyes off of him, so that you don't go to the world for your help, that you go to the Lord for your help first and foremost, and let him direct your path, that you accept the promises that he has for you and your descendants, that he's going to give us the entire new heavens and new earth, that the meek shall inherit, trust in him. I tell you these things. So we can experience these things, that we can have life here and more abundantly here through the power of the Holy Spirit, a victorious life. Not a life more abundant with more abundant stuff, but a life more abundant with more righteousness, with the Holy Spirit living in us and out of us and working through us. More abundance of more people coming to know the Lord. More people coming to follow the Lord. Redeeming the time, not wasting the time tell you these things that you sin not. But if, God forbid, you fall in the future, go back to where you heard God's voice. It doesn't have to be physically going back to Bethel, <laughs> as Abraham did. But crying out to the Lord, call upon him. The state of mind where you hear God, repent, confess, accept his forgiveness, that quickly, as soon as you realize this, the mistake that you made, don't think, oh, I've got to beat myself. Oh, this was so horrible. I've got to wait here for years and years. Oh, God will never forgive me. Oh, I've got to become better. Oh, I've got to do better before I'll be accepted in the Lord. No, go right back to the Lord. Go right back and call upon him. His love and his acceptance is there because, again, he already sacrificed himself for us. His forgiveness is already there. We benefit from it as we confess our sins. We receive his forgiveness. But he's already first loved us. He's already given himself for us. So don't wait. Don't delay. Come back to Bethel. Come back to the house of God. Come back to the place of God. Come back to the altar where you heard God's voice. Come back to where you called on the name of the Lord. And cry out to him in mind and in heart. And back to that first love experience with the Lord. And again, that's not as much a physical place as a mental place. We surrender your heart to the Lord. Be born anew, anew, if necessary. 
re-surrender your life to him. If your life has gone off on a tangent, maybe you were on fire for the Lord once, maybe you're still doing the routine. You're here, you're listening to the sermon, but you're not that same first love experience. And right now, call out upon him. Call in the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. Lord, help me. Lord, work in my life. Fill me with your spirit to overflowing. And let your light shine in me and out of me. And so, as we prepare to pray in a minute, if that applies to you, then cry out to him. Right here and now. Don't delay. Secondly, if there's something from the past, some sin still on your record, some mistake that you made in the past, some area of the world that you went down to, and you haven't given that over to the Lord, then confess it now and accept his forgiveness and his cleansing and his transforming power to keep you from falling in the future, moving forward. Maybe there's some area in your life, maybe just one area where you're in Egypt. Maybe most areas you're not. Maybe like that young man who came to the Lord saying, I've done all these things since my youth. And Yeshua said, there's one area you're lacking. Maybe there's one area where you're in Egypt. Maybe most of that week you're serving the Lord, you love the Lord, your thoughts are on the Lord. But maybe there's one aspect, one thing you still love that God says to give up. Maybe there's some activity or some thought pattern. Maybe most of your thoughts appear, but maybe one area where you still dwell on something that's not good. Maybe there's one area of desire, maybe one area of want or covet or dissatisfaction. Maybe most areas you're strong in the faith, but maybe there's one area you fear. One area you're still moved by fear. And the devil's pushing that button every so often. Whatever it is, that one area, surrender it to the Lord. Come out of Egypt, come out of Babylon. Come into God's faith, come into God's truth. Walk in his light and in his truth. Accept the cleansing, accept the death to self, and accept God's power to move you forward. So if that applies to you in a moment, we can pray and ask him to do that. If you want to just praise the Lord for the abundance of what he's given us, if you want to thank him for being born in this day and age, in a day and age where we might be able to see the Lord coming in the clouds, what a privileged age we live in. What a privileged population, what a privileged group God has put us in. And the sooner we allow him to cleanse us and live in us and out of us, take the gospel to the world, then we will see. It's waiting on us, no other thing. It can happen in our day. It's up to us. We want to thank him for that. We want to thank him again for the privileges and, and the extended life that we have. We live longer than probably any generation in earth's history. We want to thank him for health and life that you have freedom, that you have a car, a house, or whatever you have, clothes, whatever you have, and thank him, praise him, and then ask him to use that time and use those resources for his honor and glory. If you want to accept the gift that you and your descendants will inherit the earth, physical descendants, spiritual descendants, people you witness to, if you want to claim that promise, that promise that was to Abraham is to each one of us, Lord, I claim the new heavens and earth. I claim my heavenly home because of you. I claim the mansions you're preparing for me because of what you have done in my behalf. I claim that. And I claim that for those that you're calling, have, 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 have used me to reach out to and witness to in the past and present and future. I claim that for them as well, Lord. Bring descendants with me. Bring people with me because of your grace, because of your mercy. Or if you want to thank him for the mercy that he's had upon you. You've messed up in your life, small, big, whatever, and God mercifully protected you. You went down a one-way street, whatever, he was not paying attention. You did some really stupid thing and you're still alive today. You want to thank the Lord. Or maybe before you came to the Lord, you did a whole bunch of real stupid stuff. Or maybe since you've come to the Lord, you've made, done some stupid... And God's mercy is upon you, and you're still alive. You're serving him, and you want to thank him. Because you didn't deserve it. No more than Abraham deserved it. You want to just thank the Lord. And the moment we pray, you can just praise him. For his mercy endures forever. Thank him for loving you. In spite of you, in spite of me, thank him. He loves us.
for his goodness, because he is good. So if any of those areas apply to you, let us pray and let God do those things in our lives. Our Lord and our God, King of the universe, we are thankful for your calling upon us. Thank you that you've called us out of Babylon, you've called us out of Egypt, you've called us to your throne, you've called us to your heart. Thank you for first loving us. Thank you for providing for us from your abundance, from your storehouses in heaven. Thank you for giving us more than we could ever ask or thank. Thank you for giving us life and health and strength, minds and hearts to serve you and to know you and prosperity in this generation. We thank you and we praise you, Lord. Use us and use this time and use these means for sharing your gospel with the world, with all that we come in contact with. Use us as we move forward to, in our lives, day by day, wherever we go, gas station, wherever we are, setting up altars for you, leaving tracks, leaving cards, leaving invitations for people to come and know you. Use us, Lord. Use our fingers and our voice in spreading your word, letting your truth be known. Lord, thank you for having mercy upon us and our, the stupid things that we've done in our lives, the mistakes and sins that we've done, Thank you for your mercy that you have not struck us down, but have given us more time and more chances and more opportunities because of your forgiveness and your grace and your mercy. Thank you, we praise you. And Lord, for those, any of us that have sin on our record still, we ask for your cleansing, blood of the Messiah to wash us clean. Convict us, search us, try us. Reveal what else is in our lives from the past or present. Hold us fast and keep us into the future. Keep us from falling. Keep us from sinning. Let your light shine from us and out of us. Remove from us all fear. The Lord rebuke you. Satan, you have no right over us. God has not given us a spirit of fear. Lord, fill us with love. Fill us with power. Fill us with sound minds. In Yeshua's holy name. Amen.